This episode is brought to you by Morty, Buzzshot, Cogs by Clockwork Dog, and Patreon supporters like you. On a typical episode, hosts David Spira and PG Law explore immersive gaming from all angles with guests who really know their stuff. In this episode, we'll be taking a look back at what I feel is one of our best seasons yet. For new listeners, we hope it will be a great introduction to what the podcast is all about. And for our regular listeners, a reminder of the most interesting, entertaining, and impactful moments from Season 6. We'll start with Episode 1. Christian Vernon and Zach McCrell are the creators of Doors of Divergence. The approach to building their Brooklyn-based escape room started with a challenge to themselves. Tackle the issue of replayability. Having played Doors of Divergence many times, it's safe to say that David was impressed with the results. I want to kick off this episode with a bold statement. The work that you and your team are doing with Doors of Divergence is, for me, the most exciting thing in escape rooms in 2023, and it isn't close. I've been wondering why you chose to attack replayability as intensely as you have. Christian, you got to tell him. Well, uh, (laughs) David, you are partly to blame for this. I think it was the 2018 Transworld uh, Room Escape Conference in Nashville. And I remember you giving a speech of some sort where at some point you had said that replayability is not something that's really possible in escape rooms. And at that point, we had been experimenting with some things with Sanatorium because it had evolved and changed since you'd come through and played it in 2016. And we had already had two diverging storylines and were playing around with things. And I knew I hadn't really cracked it yet. But when you said, yeah, replayability is not something you're really going to find, like escape rooms, you can't really do it. I remember sort of leaning back in my chair and going, all right, that's a gauntlet. Let's pick it up. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. So when, when we had the chance to take the rights for these shows, when Indoor Extreme Sports closed down, I knew that the very first thing I wanted to do was really attack replayability from a substantial standpoint. It's funny that is what kind of inspired you, because at the time, I would say that my feelings on that are different now. Some of that is your responsibility, but some of it is also... The economics of escape rooms are different than they used to be. Back in 2018, the games were just opening left and right. And as a player, the argument that I had posited from that stage was that escape rooms are opening so rapidly in most places that it doesn't really make sense for me as a player to go back to the same set and same space that I had just been to because there's another five games that open this month down the street from you. That is not necessarily the case anymore as budgets and level of quality have jumped up so much, especially amongst the higher level games. So I think that you are ahead of the curve on this. I think also in using actors, because even though like some of the first famous escape rooms were like trapped in a room with a zombie, you know, and there is a live actor, but a lot of times Having an actor in the escape room, it wasn't really like interactive theater, right? They were maybe a game master or something like that. And so I think in these past few years, as we've seen more uh, immersive theater merging with escape rooms, now you're seeing options for that replayability, if anything, just to play with the actor, right? And you get a different experience then. But it feels like you guys are doing something completely different from that as well. Yeah, I agree. There was a point where there was a lot of actors in escape rooms where it just felt like this is a gimmick. This isn't something you have to have. It's just there so you can put the sticker on the tin and claim that you're different. We're both believers that if you're going to do something in a production, there has to be a legitimate reason for it. I mean, there are certain stories you should only tell in certain mediums, right? And if you're going to have an actor in there, it should very well center around or at least substantially use them in a way that changes the game and you couldn't possibly do it without the actor in the room. Yeah, I mean, both the shows just have huge moments in them that you can't achieve with anything other than an actor. Pre-recorded video animatronics, you would not get the same feel that you get from that particular sequence without it being a live person who you've been talking to for 30 minutes. Yeah, and I can vouch for your games having made 
very clever and moving and impactful use of performers. You also do use pre-recorded video very effectively. So what are some of the challenges that replayability presents? What are some of the challenges it doesn't present? Um, <laughs> shorter list. Yeah, our design cycle, I have to figure, is much longer and much more involved. With any of this stuff, it's tale as old as time. As soon as you start adding that variability in, you change one thing that's going to cascade across everything. This is a little bit of reveal about Heresy at the very least. But one of the things we did, because Heresy was the first show we redesigned, was try and separate the two paths as much as possible with physical space. And that really helped, obviously, means that if we don't move one thing, it doesn't affect everything else. But with Madness, it's all in the same space. So you move one thing, the whole thing cascades. And that's really the biggest challenge overall is just making sure the whole thing hangs together. It's all cohesive and you are not leaving too many red herrings for people or anything like that. Due to the unexpected closing of their venue space, Doors of Divergence is currently looking for a new home and in the meantime is designing their third room in the series, Causality 1971. We hope to see them again soon. When a new form of entertainment arises, new Guinness World Records rise with them. In episode 2, Rich Bragg, founder of the Top Escape Room Project, or Terpicas, took a moment to fill us in on what it takes to not only achieve a Guinness World Record, but to help create one from scratch. In October 2018, you, Dan Egnor, Anna Ulin, and Amanda Harris collectively set the first ever escape room Guinness World Record, most escape rooms played in 24 hours. Your team set the record at 22 games during a marathon in Moscow, Russia. I'm curious to hear the backstory. What motivated this run? What's going on here? Well, it first started with, I think, Dan just coming up with this idea of, hey, we're all starting to want to travel to play escape rooms. And we have found out about some really cool games in different places. And I don't exactly know what made him suggest Moscow, but he's like, hey, let's go to Moscow. They've got a bunch of cool games there. And so I was like, all right, why not? <laughs> so we had the trip planned before the whole Guinness attempt. And as we were researching rooms in Moscow, we find that there's this company called Claustrophobia, which had, I don't know, something like 10 locations and like 60 different games all in Moscow. And they are open 24 hours. So if you want to book a game at 3.30 in the morning, sure, you can do that. And so I was thinking, we've always talked about like, we played 10 games in a day. That was pretty cool. And just over dinner, we were brainstorming. And I was like, maybe we should see like, since we have this sort of rare opportunity where there's one company and they're open all night, maybe we can just play nonstop for 24 hours and see how many we can do. We kicked that around a little bit, and then it motivated me to go check and see if there was any kind of Guinness World Record on that, and there wasn't. So I researched a bit more on how do you get a Guinness World Record in a category that doesn't exist yet. And I went through the whole process. You basically have to apply to them and say, hey, this is a record we think is worth having and why, and we'd like to do it. And it's actually a pretty simple application. And if they like your idea, they come back to you with a whole set of rules. Okay, here's your record and here's all the rules for you. And they obviously didn't really know a lot about escape rooms when they came up with the initial set of rules. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. was going to say, like, even with time, how do you consider something completed? And like, does it have to be a one hour escape room? Or, you know, what if it's a 10 minute escape room? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Buckets of gray area. Yeah. So their first draft of the rules came back. And we read them over and we're like, OK, we need to help them with this. <laughs> so they did answer some of the questions. So they said that one of the things is that the rooms had to be at least 30 minutes long. So that was good. They said that it had to be a team of four, which fortunately, that's how many we were planning to do. So that worked out. One of the weird rules they had in the original version was that they said that we could play multiple rooms simultaneously if we wanted, where we could each break up. We could do like two people in each room, playing separate rooms at the same time, and these would all count towards the total. So if we wanted to split and do four rooms solo all during the same hour, that'd be fine. That that sounds a little, little iffy. Yeah. 
They got that killed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, we were not a fan of that rule. So we wrote back to them and say, can you please get rid of this rule? Because that's not really what any people in the escape room industry think of is like playing a bunch of games in the same day. That's not in the spirit of the experiences. Yeah. So they got rid of that one. I can't remember. There, there may have been a couple other things that they changed, but we ended up with one that seemed reasonable enough. Um, as far as how long you had to stay in the room, basically, if you finished the room, no matter how early you finished, you could leave. If you failed the room, you, have, of course, had to stay the entire time up to the failure, and it would still count towards the number that you played. But then, of course, you know, if you fail a room, it's taking you the maximum amount of time, so it's harder to play more rooms that way. So since I don't think... Very many of us will be visiting Moscow anytime in the near future. What were some of the more interesting trends or experiences that you encountered there? Because I know that there were a couple of, shall I say, outlandish experiences. Yeah, so one of the games that really stood out to me was a game that was called Sacrum Labyrinth. And this was a giant labyrinth game that was in an old burned out warehouse out in the middle of the sort of industrial district of Moscow, which felt really strange. And we had to go through this gate where they didn't speak English and it felt very military and scary to get through. And we eventually found our way back and get into this game. And we had to like go up through some floors in this old burned out building to get to them on the third floor. But the second floor was like all destroyed and it looked like it was going to fall through. And it was like, what are we doing in this place? You're like, these sets are fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, seriously. I feel like I'm legitimately in danger. (laughs) No, absolutely. Yeah, feeling legitimate danger was actually a a through line on the Moscow games too. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) so this game had what a few games had in that they had several different modes you could choose of play. And the modes were regular, hard, and hard with pain. (laughs) And basically, this is a horror game, mind you. But if you choose hard with pain, that basically means that they can, like, attack you. This is so Russian. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And this was a common thing. Like, there were a handful of games where those were the standard options across a lot of the rooms. And so I think this was the first one we played where we were, like, presented with that. And I was like, okay, can you demonstrate on Dan what the heart of pain feels like? <laughs> Show me on the ignore how you plan to touch me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they like twisted his arm a little bit and I'm like, all right, we'll do it. And so we tried. Oh, hard- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think Amanda loved it. Uh, I've played a lot of games with Amanda Harris. That does not sound like her idea of a good time. Wait, so how extreme did it get then? Because you guys did opt to play on the pain mode. Yeah. So it was this crazy labyrinth. And basically what would happen is that there were all these monsters running through the labyrinth. And if you would get caught in a corner, which you could because it was legitimately huge and you could easily get lost in there. And I did sometimes for 10 minutes at a time, which is a long time when you're lost in a maze. The monster would come up to you and basically like grab you and squeeze you. And to me, it felt a little bit like tickle torture. To other people, it felt less positive than that. (laughs) They just grab you and wrestle around with you for a little bit. And then after about 10 seconds, they would stop and give up, run away. And usually when they did that, they would actually help you back onto a path that would help you find where you're going. Yeah, it was a different experience. (laughs) This episode was full of great stories and also the origin and ripple effects of the Chirpica Awards. If you're interested in what it takes to rank the top escape rooms in the world, I highly recommend having a listen to episode two. One of our most popular episodes this season was episode three. Our guest was Christine Barger. Christine has developed a large social media following and has recently opened her first escape room, the 13th basement in Anaheim, California. One thing that sets Christine apart from most other owners is that she allows them to take pictures and even film in the room. We join the conversation as it turns to owners' concerns about spoilers being posted online. We've spent almost a decade being told that the reason we aren't allowed to take a photo is because it will ruin the experience for other people and that everybody's out to steal puzzles and ruin the experience. And that's why we're not allowed to do the thing we want to do. When we decided and made that decision, okay, everybody's going to be allowed to take photos. Everybody, not just important people in the social media world or bloggers. Everybody can come in and be that celebrity for their own experience. We were worried. 
I have always felt like the I cannot allow people to take photos because they will steal my designs. They will steal my puzzles. I have always taken that as a Lady Macbeth thing. The lady doth protest too much. Whenever they say that, they're just seeing blood on their hands and they're like, yep, I stole all of these puzzles from that crappy company down the street. Because it's rarely the amazing companies that have really novel, interesting games that are just like, oh, taking photos in here is an absolute disaster for me. No, it's the mediocre companies where I'm pretty sure they copied all their puzzles anyway. So I, yeah. I just hear it and I assume that this is you kind of admitting guilt. Two things. One, our game is a parody and it's an homage to other games, specifically horror escape rooms from nine years ago. So we already <laughs> stole all our puzzles from everybody else. And our puzzles were not original ideas. They were, what have we seen so many times we have to find a new way to do it? But that is the novelty that the novelty right. in puzzles is not that you come up with a brand new puzzle type because they don't really exist like they do. But in puzzle hunts, for the most part, we're recombining and putting interesting twists on things that already exist. That is the creativity. That is the novelty. We weren't reinventing the wheel. We were just trying to make a better wheel. Yeah. And so we didn't care if anybody thought they were going to steal our ideas. And two, someone came and played our game, who is an owner overseas. And there's one puzzle in the game that is actually very much original. It came out of a struggle with a puzzle that just wasn't working. We'd beta tested for nine weeks on our game and we still had this puzzle in there and we thought it was going to work and it just wasn't working. And it used to be lights and switches and a sign. And we tried many ways to make it work. It didn't work. So I threw together something in like a day to replace it. Because I was like, I got to make an easier puzzle. This isn't working. We're going to rip all the lights out. We had 10 lights in there. We ripped them all out of the ceiling. We did. We just redid it in a day, this one puzzle. And I just came up with something. It wasn't anything I'd ever seen before. I just did it. And we had somebody come play our game. And I wasn't there that day, but Jeremiah said he loved that puzzle so much. He told Jeremiah to his face, I am going to put this puzzle in my next game. <laughs> <laughs> And I was so honored by that because <laughs> if it was good enough that somebody wanted to steal it and they'd never seen it before and he has a chain, how cool that I was able to come up with something that I can be proud to say I really did create that in such a way that no one had seen it before. And I'm really proud of that. I mean, imitation is the purest form of flattery. <laughs> exactly. Take all the pictures you want. Steal my puzzles. That's fine. I'm so excited that you're having fun and that we made something that's worth stealing. I would say the amount of gumption that it takes for an enthusiast to actually get off their butts and build something is very low. So <laughs> most of the people playing are probably not going to steal it and then go open up their own escape room based on all your puzzles. <laughs> no kidding. There's one other thing about the influencers and photos that I did want to bring up with our room specifically. We've worked really hard to turn our escape room into its own influencer. We spend a lot of time on our social media sharing things from our game. We share in-game moments. We share videos that we make in the room using the props that we're really proud of because we put a lot of time and effort into them, so show them off. And we've created a TikTok account where we post almost every day. I try to keep up with the trends and we've had several videos go viral and it's brought a ton of business from people that have never done escape rooms before. And we're really proud of that. Anything that is bringing in new players is something that I'm a fan of. And this is why we want to improve our social media presence. I think one of the main reasons why people don't even try an escape room is because they're afraid. When I Google escape rooms, a lot of the questions, like questions on Reddit are like, can someone please tell me what this escape room is like? Or does some, are there videos? Because I'm really nervous. You know, mm -hmm. I want to know what it'll look like. I want to know how scary it'll be. So when you remove that fear, I think people will be more willing to come try it. We've had a lot of, especially young people who said, we decided on your game because we could see inside. That's the main reason we knew what we were getting into. It's totally sensible. Fear of the unknown is a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then we've also had people drive hours to play our game because they saw a viral video and they thought it looked fun. They didn't even know it was an escape room. They had no <laughs> idea what they were signing up for. That's hilarious. <laughs> they just drove two hours <laughs> so they could see the thing from the TikTok. And we're like, okay, so we're going to separate you from your friends at the beginning. And they were like, oh, what's the blindfold for? I'm like, you're going to wear it. Here we go. (laughs) That's the most amazing is to just walk in completely blind. That's the best. (laughs) They're like, there's puzzles in this? We're like, yeah. Uh, You really didn't go to the website, did you? (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. How many escape room owners do you know with nearly a million followers on TikTok? If you're ready to learn a thing or two about social media and perhaps have your perspective shifted just a bit, be sure to catch Christine in episode three. Every year, Room Escape Artist holds Recon, the Reality Escape Convention. In 2023, it took place virtually, and attendees were invited to take part in a virtual escape room developed by puzzle designer Mark Larson called The Shop of Theseus. In episode four, Mark ran some very special guests through this virtual escape room. Adol, Aaron, and JPC are the hosts of the hilarious podcast, Hey Riddle Riddle. We join them as they enter the shop of Theseus for the first time and begin to look around. This is the address you were told, and the sign up front says the shop of Theseus, but looking through the doors, it's pitch black. You cautiously step inside, excited to partake in another fantastic event at Recon, but inside you smell something burning. The place is a mess. It looks like something exploded. Before you have time to investigate, a voice fills the air. Hey, you must be my Hey Riddle Riddle group right on time. Well, I got a bit of a problem. I was doing one last check in the control room, making sure the game was ready to go for you when I heard this big boom from the lobby. Uh, Power went off and, well, you can see what happened. Uh, But don't worry. We just need to get the power back on and we'll be ready to go. Uh, There's a breaker box behind the desk. Uh, Use the flashlight on the counter. Oh, and watch where you step. We don't want any injuries for signing the waiver. (laughs) The voice trails off, leaving you in the darkened lobby. You reach over the counter and find a sturdy flashlight. Turning it on, oh, it's amazingly bright, like the sun. You shine it around the room and search the breaker box and find it in the corner. Uh, First thing I do, if I ever smell anything burning, Mark, I immediately check to see if I taste metal. Yeah, you uh, you lick the air, trying to see if you taste any metal, lick yourself a little bit. No, no, no metal taste, luckily. Oh, phew, okay, in the clear. I immediately grab the flashlight, I hold it as high over my head as I can. I say, I'm the flashlight lord, if anyone wants the flashlight, they go through me. <laughs> this, this is going to be so 10 hours. I'm doing this by myself, I think. Uh, <laughs> sorry, guys, they, they're here to sabotage. <laughs> um, hmm. Let's open that breaker box, huh? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, you carefully move behind the counter and open the breaker box. Uh, Inside, you see one comically large switch. And as you flip it, the lobby lights come to life. You now get a full view of the lobby. The floor is covered in this plush shag carpet that squelches with water as you step on it. There's a nice waiting area in the corner beside an aquarium and a full wall of merch. And in the opposite corner, a leaderboard is hung on the wall over a small stack of signs with various enthusiastic messages, which sits near a giant vending machine. And in the center of the room, is a display that looks like it's recently exploded. The voice from the speaker returns. Hey, nice work on that bonus puzzle. (laughs) Uh, Last thing, uh, we just need you to complete the waiver. Uh, It's on the tablet attached to the counter. Thanks. You never hear squelch used in a positive way. I just want to mention that. (laughs) Um, I guess we grab the waivers now that we can see them. I think we read over them first because we're pretty pretty well versed in legalese. Yeah, we've been burned before. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you head over and grab the waivers. They're mounted to the front desk here with some kind of like steel mount that's bolted to the table. And as you touch it, an empty battery icon blinks in the middle of the screen. Ugh, how typical. An escape room with an uncharged waiver tablet. We go and sit on the couch. Well, we, we wait for our limo to we come. We want to sit. <laughs> You've had too much effort already, you know, walk yeah. around for a good 30 seconds. So you head over to the waiting area. There's these two plush dark blue couches. They're flanking this rectangular coffee table. Uh, on the table, there is a box for a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle, and that very puzzle in the middle of being assembled, but it looks like it's missing at least half of its pieces. Near the puzzle, there's a small directional lock with a tag tied to the shackle. 
We call that a pig jaw puzzle, but that's fine. It kind of um, doesn't matter that I can tell that it's missing the pieces. I've seen a puzzle, and now I must complete it. So I will. Uh, I'll be sitting down and working on the puzzle. If His brain is broken. Mm-hmm. That's he what an episode for JPC is. He works on the jigsaw puzzle. Well done. Yep. <laughs> is there like a charger anywhere that we can find to plug in our tablet? Yeah, you search around, check around the waiting area, looking at the box for the jigsaw puzzle, around that weird directional lock that's on the table, under the couches, you check your pockets, you don't see any kind of charging cables there. In fact, you go over, check the waiver out, you check around the outside of it, there's no port to plug anything in here, you're really not sure how this thing gets charged. Hmm. Well, it obviously doesn't, that's the answer. That's bad engineering, (laughs) is what I say from my puzzle. I got a question, this lock that is by the puzzle, what kind of lock is it? It's a directional lock. Uh, okay, you're going to have to help me out here. I'm going to need way more than that. <laughs> yeah, you pick it up and you take a look at it. There's a little tag tied to the shackle. Uh, that tag does read, if it were left up to me, this lock is downright good. So we take the directional lock and we go left, up, down, right. Sounds good. You move the buttons in those directions, but the shackle fails to open. Hey, I don't know if you've seen one of these before. It's called a directional lock. You can move the button in the middle up, down, left, and right to input a series of directions. But before inputting a combination, make sure you squeeze the shackle twice to reset it. (laughs) Okay, squeeze the shackle and try the exact same thing. Left, up, down, right. Yeah, you move the button in those directions and the shackle now clicks open. Congratulations. You now know how to open the sample lock in the lobby. This is a real thing. I'm Googling this, and this exists. (laughs) Really? I bring out a cake. We celebrate uh, small victories all around. A day or two passes. (laughs) 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 Uh, Uh, Yeah, it's not attached to anything. It looks like it's just a sample lock in the lobby to teach people how this lock works. Perfect. Mark, I see an aquarium in the room. Am I able to go up to that? You bet. By the waiting area, there is this large aquarium. Amid the confusion of the room, something has sailed through the glass and caused cracks to form halfway up the sides, spider webbing up to the top, emptying most of the tank onto the carpet. In the tank, one large red fish looks stressed as it barely fits in the remaining water. Next to the fish is what looks like a black plastic pencil floating there. And the top of the tank has these rows of metal bars on it, preventing from sticking your hand in. Looks like they didn't want patrons messing with that fish that's in there. Okay, so there's a black pencil next to a red fish. Mark, I use my powers of observation and deduction to see if this red fish is a herring. You think back to your classes on fish types, a a massive amount of stuff you've got in your mind palace there with those fish. Thank you. You can't quite remember exactly what it is, but it might be of the herring family, yeah. Okay, yeah, we ignore this black pencil. (laughs) Reading a five-star review of a uh, directional lock from about five years ago. (laughs) And this guy, the guy titles the review, why didn't I think of this? Why didn't you think of this? What are you, a lock idea guy? What do you mean, why didn't you think of this? Also, were these invented in the last five years? You see, I was really looking forward to being the agent of chaos on this episode, and I'm really frustrated that you just decided it was you. Go to a pizza place and be like, why didn't I think of this? What are you talking about, man? It's been around for 1,600 years. And the insanity continues as these agents of chaos work their way through a series of devious and clever puzzles. You can also catch Adel and others on the podcast Hello from the Magic Tavern, one of my personal favorites. If you'd like to go to Recon, tickets are on sale now for Recon Los Angeles, which takes place August 18th and 19th, 2024. Just go to realityescapecon.com for tickets. Don't miss out. PG is a talented puzzle creator and she took the opportunity to show off her skills in our mid-season Halloween spooktacular. She was joined by David, Tommy Haunton, and Anne and Chris Lukeman for a spoopy night of quizzes and challenges. Chris capped off the episode with a scary story that will chill any escape room enthusiast to the bone. I don't know if this story is true, but this is what I've heard. Five years ago, on a night just like tonight, In a town just like your town, four friends decided they wanted to play an escape room. They searched online and found one nearby. The website claimed that it was the exciting new entertainment craze, but also so much more. Among the list of themes, the friends were entranced by one game, the Haunted Magician's Office. What fun they thought. This was the perfect theme for a brisk October evening. (laughs) The description was fantastical and exciting, but there was something missing. As they searched and searched through page after page in the website, 
they could only find stock photographs. There was not one single image of the venue to be found. <laughs> only green screened actors in staged photos in front of various locales, cartoon drawings of fantastical locations, and poorly photoshopped movie posters from last summer's blockbusters. But the business had five stars on Google, so it had to be great, right? <laughs> the three friends booked the game. Later that evening, as it began to grow dark, they followed the directions on their GPS and arrived at an abandoned industrial park. Not a soul could be seen. <laughs> the, scariest, <laughs> the scariest part. Cue lightning strike. <laughs> It was okay, though. The friend who booked had just received an email that explained the location was in the warehouse district, and if the booking was after five, it would be pretty dark. Rent was probably much cheaper here. But as they grew closer and closer to the pin on their phone's map, they got worried. It was 8.12. Their appointment was for 8.30, but they had been sternly warned to get there at 8.15 to sign waivers, so time was of an essence. Would they make it? Just then they rounded the corner and there it was, a singular light in a row of closed offices. They had arrived. As they walked in, never more confident of their skills, ability, and punctuality, they looked up and saw a grisly sight. There was a desk in the waiting room and above the desk, there was a leaderboard. <laughs> <laughs> On the leaderboard, they Get saw out, the name of line. their game. <laughs> and next to the name of their game, they saw their doom. It took a moment to sink in, but their spirits were dashed. This would not be the exciting night of puzzles and adventure they'd hoped for. Written in dusty chalk on the leaderboard was their imminent, inescapable demise, for they saw the room only had a 20% escape rate. <laughs> what year is it? <laughs> Nonetheless, they steeled themselves and rang the bell on the desk. After a moment, an attendant popped out from another room and briskly mentioned his name was Jeff. They should sign the waiver and he'd be right back. Jeff returned, but with him came more disturbing news. They couldn't start immediately. For you see, even though the friends had arrived at 8.15, they couldn't begin. Unbeknownst to them, they were playing the haunted office. Not by themselves, but there were two others signed up for that time slot oh, no. get out get out jeff went to the back again and the friends waited and waited as the clock struck 8 30 the door opened and two teens walked through it appeared to be a first date uh, they were giddy with awkwardness and inside jokes and kisses and snuggles and the like jeff talked them through check-in and then took the newfound team down the hall to their game. He stopped outside a door and painted a vibrant tapestry of lore and story under the hallway's fluorescent lights. Uh, the office you're about to enter belonged to a magician in the 1940s and was haunted, he said with a smile, and he uh, tossed them a walkie-talkie and opened the door, and the friends in the first date couple walked in. Jeff's final words were, you're looking for a key to escape? Talk to me on your walkie-talkie if you need any hints. Good luck. With that, Jeff closed the door and turned the lock. The newly assembled compatriots were locked in and on their own. They surveyed the scene. Quite a bit of Ikea furniture for the 1940s and not a whole lot of haunting. The room seemed more like a regular office than a haunted magician's office. But nevertheless, the team got to work. As they revealed combinations and solved puzzles, one friend found something quite perplexing, a strange number under the desk. Moments later, another <laughs> found a number on the side of a painting, and another under the rug, another on a lamp, and another inside a dog-eared book that was bent in the way that it almost always just opens on a specific page, whether you have any instructions to open it to that page or not. This continued until they had seven numbers, but what to do with them? One of the teens found a strange outline on the wall. It looks like something had been screwed in there, but had been removed. A line of wear and dust led from the outline to an empty telephone jack on the wall. It was perplexing, but undeterred, the team wrote down the numbers and continued solving puzzles across the room. About 40 minutes later, one friend exclaimed, I finished the Sudoku. 
just in time for another to find a singular black light with a dying battery. <laughs> they gathered around the unintentionally flickering light as it revealed a pig pen cipher, <laughs> which helped the team to decode a five letter word S P E L L. <laughs> that word opened a locked box to reveal the key that unlocked the door for their escape. That must have been the magic spell that dispelled the ghost, the, the group thought, as they emerged in the hallway victorious. As they walked down the hall to the lobby, the game master popped out of the controlled room. Uh, oh, did you guys make it already? Wow, that was so fast. Did you have fun? <laughs> <laughs> they all say yes automatically without thinking too much about it. Jeff smiles and continues, no one ever solves the Sudoku without a hint. I have to get back to the other game I'm running, but good night. Make sure to leave us a five-star review and your next game is 50% off. <laughs> the implications of everything he said sank in. The four friends said the requisite courteous goodbye to the teens and went to the door. But then they paused. What about those numbers? We never used those numbers. The numbers were all over the room and must have meant something. And, and what about that peculiar telephone-shaped outline on the wall? Was it a coincidence? Were they all just bizarre red herrings? They turned to ask Jeff, but Jeff was gone. No, no, wait. They, they could see him in the Game Master room, but it looks like he's giving a hint to another team over this walkie-talkie. <laughs> they probably shouldn't bother him. Oh, he looked. He saw them. Okay. He, he quickly gets up and comes to the desk. And the friends ask about the numbers. Those numbers, Jeff says. There hasn't been a puzzle using those numbers here for two years. <laughs> the three friends eventually left that escape room and got back into their car, forever haunted by the knowledge that those clues persisted in the game. They'd go on with their lives, but those clues would remain unsolved forever. And that was the tale of the ghost puzzle. <laughs> oh, bravo, bravo. <laughs> Truly terrifying. Episode five was a blast to listen to, especially since PG added in some wonderful music and scary sound effects to really set the mood. Last December, I had the opportunity to experience Club Drosselmeyer in Boston. It was an immersive event that hummed with energy and joy. But afterward, I struggled to explain it to my friends and family. Thankfully, I was able to point them to episode 6, where PG prompts creators Kellyan and Brian Pletcher to explain it themselves. Turns out that, even for them, it's not the easiest thing to do. Let's dive into what I suspect will be the most complicated question of this episode, which is, what is Club Drosselmeyer? Oh, I should have known you were going to ask me that. I'm sorry. It's too hard. It's too, I just, yeah, you just have to see it. You'll figure it out. I think this may be the most complicated question we've asked in six seasons of this show. <laughs> Give me the one minute elevator pitch. Okay. I like to tell people that it's an interactive nutcracker in swing time and it's interactive, right? Not just immersive, but interactive. It is a game. It is a nutcracker. It's actually all based on Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. We have our own original arrangement for an eight-piece swing band of all of the songs from the original Nutcracker Suite, and we have people dance these incredible performances, and it's all done in 1940s. So it's a big nightclub from the 1940s and based on Boston history. But of course, the interactive part is the part where it's a game. If you want to play, you can. If you don't want to play, it's still a wonderful night in a beautiful environment with a great bar and vintage outfits and incredible band. And we actually do have people that come that don't even realize that there's a game layer. They'll just show up and sit and look fabulous and dance and watch the floor shows. I have to imagine that the people who have no idea that there's a game layer, they must be sitting there with their drink being like, the audience is really moving around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they talking so much? <laughs> it doesn't seem like the place. This is supposed to be a show. They should sit down and be respectful. <laughs> I know. Right? They know everybody. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wonder about that. But it's a nice setup because it's also something that you can bring other people to. And I know you've gone with Lisa's parents before. 
almost every year we've gone with Lisa's parents and to give a little frame up of the different types of experiences you can have, because we all do something really different. When I'm at Club Drosselmeyer, I am up and about interacting with characters and just being the social butterfly. Lisa is usually solving a lot of puzzles with her mom. We also will steal a couple dances in the middle of the show. And then Lisa's father has never been a huge puzzle person. And he's very low key. And he has really enjoyed every year he comes, he has a drink, he watches his daughter and his wife crush some puzzles. He watches all of the dancers and the stage performances and just has a lovely, chill time. And then there are also the people who just get up and dance. They don't do anything else. Yeah, the band plays all night and all of the songs are entirely danceable. Yeah, I always wonder how I would play if I were a guest. And I'm like, oh, gosh, would I puzzle or would I just dance all night? It's a really good band. (laughs) It is a phenomenal band. For me, the thing that makes the magic of Club Drosselmeyer work is the fact that it just is what you as an individual want it to be that night. And that is such a strange thing in the immersive world. If you show up to an escape room and you don't want to solve puzzles, you don't want to interact with the props, you don't want to do anything, that escape room is going to remain still unless you have a very extraordinary game and game master that has figured out how to pull you through it. And same thing with immersive theater. You have to make your own good time, but you can just let the world go by and it's still a good time. That's the hope, right? Because what we wanted in Club Drosselmeyer was ultimately sort of a magical experience and also a low barrier to entry for a lot of different kinds of people into a lot of different communities. And I initially saw Club Drosselmeyer as a trifecta between the swing dance community, which sort of has a high barrier to entry, right? Like some people have done a little bit of swing dancing, but they find it a little intimidating. The actual people who are really good at it are very intimidating. As someone who has been dancing for a long time, but I don't consider myself fantastic, it is wonderful to watch and intimidating to dance with or next to people who are really good at this stuff. Right. And sometimes it feels that way when you go to a dance. And honestly, David, I've seen you dance. You're great. And those dancers are only like a couple of months ahead of you in terms of skill level, right? They're wonderful dancers. They're performers. But it's not quite as hard as it looks. I'm going to give them more credit than you're giving them. And I'm going to give myself a tiny bit less. <laughs> well, they're my friends. So <laughs> I'm allowed to be like, oh, that that's easy. But yeah, I, I do feel like people tend to find that kind of environment. It's sort of a high barrier to entry. And they're scared to go to a dance where everybody's dancing. They're the only one not dancing. Joss, we wanted it to be a place where you could go in and you could feel like you belong there and you could feel like there was something special going on. And maybe you would dance even if you're not a dancer even if you consider yourself a little intimidated by those other dancers. We love this idea of there being these on-roads to these different communities, different ways to experience the show. Tune in to the rest of episode six for insights into everything it takes to turn a Masonic Hall into a beautiful dance club from the 1940s. And be sure to check out the show notes from this episode to see PG dancing in a Janet Jackson video. For episode 7, we invited on another brilliant couple from Boston, Marie Huber and Nico Cesar, owners of Red Fox Escapes. They're known for their attention to detail in design and analytical approach to business, but I was most intrigued to hear about their fraught relationship with the ever-present directional lock and how sparks fly when they inevitably fail. After I played your game, The U-Boat, I wrote a piece about your unique approach to modifying a directional lock, which may have caused some stress in your life. Can you explain what you were doing and why you don't do it anymore? Master who makes the master locks, they have always emblazoned their symbol in front of their locks. And so it was a directional lock and I just felt it looked so modern. And one thing I went out of my way to do in designing The U-Boat was the U-boat was supposed to be 1941. So we didn't want to have anything non-1941. And the ridiculous degree of verisimilitude in that game 
it just goes over everyone's head, including the fact that all of the books on the bookshelf were actually published before 1941, which is a whole other disaster story in and of itself. But when it came to the directional locks, I just thought, well, if I sand off the paint and you just do one experimental one, and it looks wonderfully brushed aluminium underneath once you've sanded the paint off, no matter what the original color was. We'll put a photo in the show notes. Yes. Oh, thank you. The problem with those master locks, and I think the reason that they got discontinued is that they are very fragile. And I would say probably only 50% of the ones we ever bought actually worked out of the package. Because if you drop them, if you open them up, they've got very fragile plastic parts inside. And so if customers drop them, that already breaks them. And the problem was in the process of sanding off the paint, I think it just affected the mechanism a little bit. And they just don't have such a long half-life. So it's just a lot of love that goes into making this thing all look all pretty and brushed aluminium. And then the next thing that happens, a customer drops it. And now all of your love is down the drain and you have to put a new one in. Just like we have a jar of pennies that I want to get rid of, we have a jar of broken locks in the lobby area. That is like, all. that one is in there. I'm pretty sure. It is. Yeah, there's many master locks in there. And also, from time to time, we have the locks get jammed and the box is closed and then the players are inside the room. So we need to go and cut that lock. So they get an extra fun bit of sparks action because we actually come with an angle grinder and actually we cut the lock in front of them in order for them to access the particular box that they need to. (laughs) Lots of our customers have said that was the highlight of their game was watching us just make all of these indoor fireworks cutting off the lock. A note to any escape from owner out there, I wish I had done this sooner, but I've now done it with almost every lock where it's possible. I have drilled a hole in the shaft and I have chained up the lock next to where it belongs. A, it makes resetting much easier because the locks don't go off wandering around the room. And B, it massively extends the life of any directional lock because it stops getting dropped on the floor. So adding a little chain really has helped. So maybe I'll do some brushing of the locks again. That's fantastic. I just want you to know, though, that I appreciated the level of detail you put into the games. I think they're just beautiful. I do, too. I also, and we can talk about this in the Patreon bonus episode. I have some other thoughts about why the directional lock is being discontinued. We can explore that together later. Because they're actually fascinating if you ever look up the way that they work and the mechanism on the inside, people are amazed when you tell them it can actually take an infinite number of input directions. The mechanism in them is insane. I have opened one up as well. It is a nutty device, and I can't believe that they pack as much into that thing as they do for as low a price point as those things sell for. Hmm, did David mention something about a bonus episode back there? That's right. If you back us on Patreon at the $5 level, You'll get access to the Repod bonus show, where you can hear even more opinions on the directional lock from PG and David, Marie and Nico, among many other subjects of debate in the industry. Go to patreon.com slash roomescapeartist. We're taking a moment to thank our upcoming sponsors for Season 7, Morty, Buzzshot, and Cogs by Clockwork Dog. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing escape rooms, haunts, and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its fantastic website experience, iPhone app, and its new Android app. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, BuzzShot. BuzzShot is escape room software, powering business growth, player marketing, and improving the customer experience. They offer an assortment of pre- and post-game features, including robust waiver management, review management, and branded team photos. Streamline your marketing and grow your escape room business. Repod listeners get an extended free trial and 20% off your first three months with no setup fees or hidden charges. Visit buzzshot.com slash repod, that's R-E-P-O-D, to learn more. And thank you to sponsor COGS by Clockwork Dog. COGS is an easy to use software hardware platform for running interactive events, including escape rooms and other immersive experiences. They have plug and play hardware that seamlessly integrates with their software that makes it easy to create a show with lighting and sound cues. 
Get the COG starter set for only $130 plus free shipping to the USA. This bundle is usually valued at $257. You can learn more and purchase your starter set at COGS.show. Use code REPOD at checkout. Again, that's R-E-P-O-D. Thank you so much to Morty, Buzzshot, and COGS by Clockwork Dog. Our sponsors are making Season 7 possible. You can find the links and details in the show notes. Supporting our sponsors supports this podcast. Eric Berlin has a long history in the world of puzzle making. In episode eight, you can hear how he brazened his way into the games magazine board game night and how he made a New York Times crossword puzzle that was also an escape room. But a puzzle hunt story he told is so well known that it came up unprompted again later in the season. So you better know it too. Here's the story of Be Noisy. You created a puzzle game that doesn't have an answer called Spaghetti. Oh. Can you explain what this is? I don't know if I can, but let okay. me try. <laughs> so when we were talking before about the mystery hunt, I said that a round consists of a, some number of puzzles. Let's call them feeder puzzles because their answers will feed into the meta puzzle. And uh, once you solve the, the meta puzzle, you are done with that round. Over the years on my team, Palindrome, I have found that the people in Palindrome and, and puzzle people in general are very good at finding patterns in words that were not meant to be there. Perhaps the most famous story in Mystery Hunt lore is Be Noisy. Do you know Be Noisy? Have you heard of this? No. I will tell you the Be Noisy story. Back in, I want to say 2000 or so, where there was a hunt based on the game Monopoly. The whole hunt was a giant Monopoly game. And you were collecting hotels. And when we are studying a list of words on palindrome, we tend to write them very carefully on the blackboard or put them in a spreadsheet in a monospaced font. Because if there's something reading down a column or reading on the diagonal, you want to be able to see it. So when you say that, just to paint a picture for people, this is a font where the letters are all the same size. So exactly. if you write out five words that are all five letters, regardless of whether you're using an I or an M, they take up the same amount of space and they'll look like a perfect grid. Exactly. Because we're well used to having hidden messages in a list of answers that we have generated. So we wrote this on the board. And a teammate of mine saw on the diagonal, B-E-N-O-I-S-Y. Now, this message, be noisy, did not use the last answer in the list, which was weird and probably therefore wrong. But we were stuck and we didn't know what else to do. And maybe this is something. I don't know. So we called up Game Control and they answered the phone and a room full of people just yelled. Ah! And they said, uh, hello. <laughs> they had no idea why we were screaming at them. <laughs> and then a little while later, a second team <laughs> called and also screamed at them because they also found... <laughs> And eventually they figured out why this was happening. Uh, it was it was a, a, it was a complete accidental red herring. <laughs> and it's indicative of our ability to see a pattern in these words. In the game of spaghetti, I present anybody who wants to play it with a bunch of random words. These words are not a puzzle in any way, shape, or form. I chose them at random from a dictionary. And I say, go solve it anyway. <laughs> Find the answer to this random bunch of words. I give you five words, and I allow you to add a sixth word of your own choosing, if, if you wish. So you have six words. They are completely nonsense. 
And yet, inevitably, somebody in the Mystery Hunt community, somebody in the puzzle community finds an incredibly elegant solution that takes you to an answer. Sometimes I wonder whether I chose these randomly or whether I I subliminally chose words that have a pattern. There was one time that somebody saw that each word had a single duplicated letter. It was an isogram except for one letter. An isogram and an isogrammatic word, every letter is different. In these words, it was an isogram except for one letter that was the same. And these letters did not spell anything, but the letter that followed the second letter, when you read those down or possibly anagrammed them, it spelled a word. And it's like, man, how did you find that? It's just amazing to me. People have applied Morse code to the vowels or the consonants. People have applied the periodic table of elements. They've taken element symbols out and rearranged them to spell something. And if you look in the show notes, you'll find that we've made our own spaghetti. I've got it here if you want to write it down. Floor, shyly, rack, clock, and slump. Can you find the pattern? Another one of our most popular episodes this season was our chat with Eric Wastel, creator of the Advent of Code. In this clip, Eric tells us what Advent of Code is, but more importantly, why he created it and why he brings it back every December. All right, let's just start at the beginning. What exactly is Advent of Code? So Advent of Code is a combination of advent calendars and programming puzzles. Some people celebrate Christmas. If you celebrate Christmas, you might be familiar with a thing called an advent calendar. An advent calendar is basically a way to count down to Christmas. It's uh, typically like a box of treats or toys or little ornaments that you hang up or something, but you don't access them all at once. You only access one per day. So if it's a box, the box has 25 doors on it. If it's a little like tree with ornaments or something, there's 25 pouches and you only to, so you count down to Christmas one per day. Unless it's chocolate and you have no self-control. That's true. Yeah. At which point it's counting down until diabetes, which is also fine. <laughs> so you have an advent calendar, which is a thing with 25 something in it, and you're counting down until Christmas. In this case, advent of code is an advent calendar, but it contains programming puzzles. It's usually a question about like, you know, you need to save Christmas. And in order to do so, the elves need to figure out how many widgets have to go in each of these stacks. And you figure out how many widgets and you type in the number and it's like, good job. You figured out how many widgets go in the stack. You win. And then every puzzle has a part two. And part two is usually, ah, but now the widgets are six feet tall and made of marble. Now, how do you stack them? And then you have to go and figure out the new, how, whatever it is to stack them. And you give the new answer and it says, great, you did both halves of this puzzle. Well done. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. (laughs) Instead of people leaving, they all go on Reddit and yell about how cool the answer that they found was or now the visualization that they made with the crane that stacks the six foot tall marble columns, whatever. And off it goes until the next day when the next puzzle comes out and we do it all over again 25 times. Awesome. You have just gone over a lot of different things and we're going to go and break all of that down one question at a time. But... The first follow-up that I really want to ask you is not how you started Advent of Code, because that's very well documented, but I'm curious why. I like helping people become better programmers as a tangential interest to teaching more broadly. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy training. I've worked in a bunch of different engineering organizations where I've enjoyed teaching specific skills or helping people understand particular concepts or whatever. I enjoy learning. I enjoy asking questions. I enjoy when people can teach me things. And so at some point I said, I would like to help people become better programmers. If I do it one-on-one, then I can help one person per time unit. If I teach in a code boot camp or something, I can help like 12 people or 50 people or whatever it is. If I teach at a university, I could teach like 700 people at once, right? If I teach online and it's not something where I am spending a fixed amount of time per person, I can teach an arbitrary number of people. I love teaching people stuff. I love helping people get better at programming. And so Advent of Code was one of a lot of different ways that I've tried to do that. All of the other ways failed miserably and Advent of Code got picked right up. So it's a a lot of luck involved there as well, but I made it in the interest of just 
enjoying helping people improve their programming skills, which is, I know, kind of a very specific joy, but it's true. We love making things that help people improve their escape room design and playing. So I don't think it's that far a distance there. I think yours might be more practical in the grand scheme of things. One of the things that I found that I struggle with a lot when I'm learning, for example, like new programming concepts or or things in that domain is it is really easy to find a programming language. Google top programming languages and pick one. Find a programming language, no problem. It is really easy to find documentation on that programming language. Okay, great. You found your programming language, Google programming language name, documentation. The first hit is the dot, right? You're done. It is really hard to figure out what you should make now that you've found a programming language, right? You, as a beginner programmer, have no sense of what project is hard and which one is easy, right? There's an XKCD about this, where this program is given a task that it's like, we need you to write a program that'll figure out whether a picture is taken in a national forest. And they're like, yeah, that's no problem. I'll just do a GPS lookup and tell me. And whether the picture is of a bird. And they're like, I'm going to need a research team in five years, right? Because it's a complete, but right, but like as a beginner, if you're going to sit down and say, I'm going to learn this programming language, I'm going to practice some stuff. Let me tackle a problem. Knowing even what to begin on and what to tackle on is is impossible without finding somebody who can already know and can already tell you or trial and error, right? There's no way to discern the nature of difficulty in software as a beginner without a lot of extra effort. Giving somebody on a silver platter, here is a problem that I promise will be pretty easy, right? It's not going to be trivial. It's not going to be automatic, right? You will have to do some assessment and some thought. You might have to look up specific skills in that documentation you just found a second ago. You might have to look up, like, how do I take a sequence of letters and reverse it, right? Or you might have to look up, like, how do I get letter number seven out of that list, or right? Something like that. But now that I've given you some bite-sized problem that is within your grasp that you can do, now you know what to tackle, and you have a reason to tackle it and a reason for those concepts to actually stick in your brain. Listen to the rest of episode nine to find out what unexpected audiences have played Advent of Code and also why you should never send Eric a puzzle idea. Since the early 1980s, Lonnie Hansen has created immersive installations all over the world, including elaborate Christmas tree sculptures for window displays at Neiman Marcus in Dallas. There was an underwater tree made out of blown glass, a tree made out of paper money, and one made entirely out of taillights and fins from old Cadillacs. All of this was documented by HGTV for a show called Holiday Windows. Lonnie had hoped to have his own show called Lonnie's World. In this clip, he recalls the experience of being involved in the early days of reality TV. Lonnie's World is a YouTube classic pilot that we cut, and we were this close to getting picked up by Discovery or HGTV, and an LA agent blew it, and we didn't get there. But I loved doing television. It was a lot of fun. There are three episodes of HGTV's Holiday Windows, that was the name of the show, that I believe you put up on YouTube. Yeah, sort of excerpts. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. I watched all of them. (laughs) These episodes all followed near identical story structures. Your client, Ignaz, sent you a FedEx package with a clue about the theme. You settled on a design after a draft or two were rejected. You did some research. You built. Something went wrong. You had a moment where it looks like your soul is leaving your body. And then you get the tree done just in time. It all wraps with Ignaz telling you that he has an even more fun idea for next year. I'm curious how much of this was the structure that the TV show needed and how much of this was the structure of the client relationship? It started very honest and naive. And this was early in reality television. So this is 2001 to 2007. And originally it was shot documentary style. They would literally hang out with us for hours on hours while I was working on stuff. And we set up saying, okay, I'm going to blow a bunch of sugar today, or I'm going to cook a bunch of sugar today or whatever. And I think that I saw pretty quickly that when I did take a pratfall or something went wrong, we caught on very quickly in the first year that you tended to get the bumper 
before commercials. <laughs> you started uh-huh. to game this. Yeah, you got to get you started to game the cameras. The more mistakes <laughs> I made, the more bumpers I was getting. And the versions that are on YouTube are cut downs of, of my track. But those were hour specials. Those were hour long specials. And you also followed Macy's and you followed the other window dressers. We ended up with a finale in the first episode that we did. And then at that point, I think there was a little bit of structure by the producers of knowing that there had to be this arc. And I have to say, Ignaz is an amazing client, but you mentioned that moment that the blood runs out of my face and that I'm going to lose my soul. I, I like on the sugar, I don't know if you saw the sugar tree. Oh, I did. It looked like a hellish project. It was a hellish project. The other ones looked like they were challenging. The sugar tree looked like a miserable project. I was learning sugar in Denver, which has zero humidity. Yep. And then we had to go to Dallas. We had to drive everything down there. And we had to go to Dallas and cook in this fabulous million dollar kitchen, which was cool. But we had to use dehumidifiers and there was the humidity and everything. And we, I would literally walk out the door with a piece and it would just blow up in my hands because of the humidity. That moment when I dropped a hammer through the bottom four feet oh, no. of the tree, I was just getting it. We really were four hours out. And as I dropped the hammer and it breaks up all of these huge sugar discs, that was the moment that they tested the drop curtain outside. (laughs) And so I make this mess. And the moment that I make this mess, the curtain drops from the window in rehearsal. (laughs) And Ignaz is on the other side of the window, (laughs) looking at me with all of this broken sugar in my arms. So sugar surgery was for real. It looked it. I've been involved in enough client projects to know when like a catastrophe looks real. And that was the one that looked truly like an actual disaster that you were having to put back together. Yeah, I was truly scared. So, you know, I would think that by year six or seven, I know that by the time we got to the money tree, we were beginning to think about things that could go wrong. That makes sense. And they, I remember standing there and they'd given me this little hand device that I could have behind my back. And when I'm talking to Ignaz about the tree, because we had to put a glass railing around it because of federal laws and stuff, nobody could touch it, blah, blah, blah. And he was going to have me lean too hard on the glass railing and break a panel. And they gave me a little, one of those little devices, you know, to shock the glass. <laughs> well, you're doing stunt work now for this show. <laughs> We're having this conversation and I'm trying to be casual and I click and it doesn't break the glass and I click <laughs> and the cameras are rolling and we're trying to be cool about this. And then I see out the corner of my eye, some construction worker that just kind of rolls his eyes and takes a hammer <laughs> off camera <laughs> and hits the, the pane of glass. <laughs> Cause he was there with the next replacement pane of glass to put in. Don't miss episode 10 to hear more incredible stories from Lonnie and more about his recurring seasonal installation, Camp Christmas. Summer Herrick is the co-founder of Locurio in Seattle. Locurio is one of the earliest escape rooms to embrace storytelling and expand the medium into something new and different. In episode 11, David was curious about how the role of Summer's experience as an avid player informed the approach to designing her iconic games. I took a look at the Terpica data, and you are one of the most experienced escape room owners in the world as a player, and the most experienced owner that we've had on this show. Aside from enjoyment, what does expanding your experience as a player do for you as a creator? So much. Look, I have a lot of people that contact me saying, I'm thinking about opening an escape room. Can I meet up for coffee with you? And I try to always do that. I'm very encouraging. As a player, I want to see more games open. But the biggest piece of advice I give any of those people is play games. Play more games. There's so much to be learned. There's things to be learned from good and bad games or less well-designed games, let's say. I honestly firmly believe that 
the most you will ever learn as an escape room player who wants to be an owner is from playing absolutely terrible games and seeing all of the creative ways that negligent owners have come up with to just torture you as a player and suck the fun <laughs> out of the experience. We have interviewed enough escape room owners now to know that half the time the origin story starts off with, I played a terrible game and it inspired me to make one that was better than that one. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Just so many lessons you can learn. And I always like to say that I design from my player point of view. So I design the things that I want to play. I design the things that I'm always like, oh, why haven't I seen this done? I, I try to think of ideas that I haven't seen in any of the, I don't know where I'm at exactly, 860-ish games that I've played. Wow, you weren't kidding, David. That is pretty experienced. You're only a little bit behind David. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't being hyperbolic. I mean, look, that might also be part of the reason Little Curio has designed to escape rooms in eight years. <laughs> so <laughs> I should probably stop traveling quite so much. Um, but I do think it's so important because it blows my mind whenever I hear an escape room owner or creator say that they don't play escape rooms. It's like a novelist saying they don't read other people's books or a chef saying they don't eat at other people's restaurants. Like, how are you supposed to know what is good or bad without putting yourself into the shoes of the person experiencing it. And it's not just, oh, this game, they're not maintaining it, so all the tech props are broken. I'll never do that. That's a very basic level. There's also just the level of being able to feel what game flow feels like. Game flow is such an important thing that so many people overlook. And there's really no better way to teach yourself what good game flow feels like than to go play games that have it because you just know as you're going through an experience, I am feeling cranky. I am feeling uninvolved. I am feeling like I don't know what to do next. Having those moments is just so important to teach you how to do things right or better or more in line. And we're all different as players. So, you know, people will pick up different lessons and go in different directions. But I just, aside from being inspired by great games, which is Another thing that's huge for me, I play a great game. I get so excited. I get so excited to get back to the drawing board and design my next thing. But just really, though, learning what feels good as a player, what feels right, what transported you. I often say that my favorite moments in escape rooms are the ones that make me just spontaneously clap. <laughs> yeah. When was the last time that happened? Oh, gosh, this actually wasn't an escape room. It was in a puzzle hunt that I just played where I had the aha moment, the little thing in my brain just clicked into place. Mm -hmm. And all I could do was go, uh, <laughs> like, literally, these are the noises coming out of my mouth. Just, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> That's the greatest feeling. It's the greatest feeling. It's, it's like magic in a bottle. Like, how do you capture that? Because that moment of connection is so cool. It's such a high it's why I love puzzling and why I love escape rooms. Aside from the impact that it might have on your budget, has experiencing so many games harmed you in any ways as a creator? <laughs> Certainly, I have played a bunch now in various European countries and seeing the scope of what people are able to do over there, it can be a little disheartening as far as, you know, look, some countries, some cities, the rent is much cheaper or the staffing is much cheaper or the regulations are much lower. So I have seen some cool stuff. You go overseas and you play like a 5,000 square foot room, a single room, or you play a three and a half hour game and they're charging the same sort of prices that we charge here. And it's like, oh, I just I can't keep up with that. And it kills me. So Lucurio Europe in 20 years. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had a feeling that that was going to be your answer. There is this fear among owners that if they play other things, they're going to like burn through ideas. But I think it actually inspires you. And I think the extreme end of what this can actually do that can harm you is that you can end up adding to your imposter syndrome by experiencing these incredible things. Yes. And having them highlight what you can't do, either because of cost or real estate 
or regulation or just money or ability. There are things that you can't accomplish. But I do think that one of the things that sets you apart is that you know what you aren't doing. You're fully aware. And I think when I hear your trepidation about hyping up your games, I think it's because you know what is possible in the escape room space and you know what your games are and aren't. Whereas so many people are so eager to hype up their games without having any idea of what their games are relative to other games. Yeah. And man, I mean, you are so right about it upping the imposter syndrome because after my first European trip, I was a little horrified that Locurio games were even being mentioned in Terpica next to some of these crazy blowout experiences But I think you're totally right. It's important to remember that that's not the end-all be-all. Some of my favorite escape rooms as a player are smaller games. Or the moments that I love could have been done in a smaller game. So I think it is important, especially for us owners in the United States who are perhaps trapped by certain restrictions that other places might not have, to remember that we can still create great things. We can still focus on the things that we can do well. And to be unique, I think that's such a huge part of it that gets overlooked is uniqueness. Locurio is currently working on their third game, set to open in 2024, and they promise a deeply emotional story with loads of theatrical elements. So be sure to keep your eye on their social media channels for further announcements. Episode 12 brought us even more fabulous creators as we welcomed Mike Dold and Rick George of Doldrick's Escape Room in Orlando, Florida. They've built the entertaining and iconic games Captain Spoopy Bones and the Magnificent Quest for Some Other Pirate's Treasure and Crazy Train, the Ballad of Schemin' Plots. Here, David prompts Rick to talk about the experience of running an escape room business while raising a family you and your families are are living this business and it shows in the the consistency and the quality and the love that you feel in each and every game there's a trade off here and i know you know it and what you've built is absolutely incredible and however you choose to end up continuing with it nothing but respect from here well, how wonderful to grow up as a kid in this amazing <laughs> yeah. escape room that your parents run. My parents have a jewelry business. And so I grew up going to jewelry shows, but it was like looking at, I don't know, a bunch of like old rocks. people trying on jewelry <laughs> and me having to wipe down the showcase every five minutes. That's fine. <laughs> My son was born seven, eight, nine months before we opened. And so, I mean, he's strapped to me. There's pictures of me and Mike dealing with the contractor. and I got my kids strapped to my chest. We had the pack and play up at the front desk. I mean, when you say like to grow up in an escape room, my oldest, he spent the first three years of his life at the escape room almost every day. Yeah. Not the best father in the world having my kid there till one o'clock in the morning. But he ain't, he's not waking up till, you know, 1 p.m. It's all right. <laughs> but it's tough. It was, it's, and it's still tough. And it's tough for different reasons now. But my oldest going up through all the different aspects of the business, and I'm sitting there answering the phone, and I'm running a game, and I'm trying to feed him in the high chair next to me, and all the way to him sitting in my lap and him hitting the, hitting the talk back button and like talking into the mic for him, having to tell people like, oh, don't worry, that's just my kid. And now I've got him reading scripts and and doing voiceovers and he loves it. And he's in our latest game. He's great. He kills in Crazy Train. (laughs) He loves it. He came in and did it in one take. He does it better than I do. (laughs) And and you see it in his play though. When he plays, it's like, They build these massive play sets. And it's the same as when I was a kid, but it was never just like, I have an action figure and this is an action figure. It's like, no, I need to take all of these things and these Legos and and make this huge set. And he's coming to me saying, oh, Dedes, pretend like you can't open this door and you have to figure out what the thing is. And he's saying these things to me now. And so he's growing up in this thematic world where at any time he walks through the door, he can go and run through lasers or he can go and see fog machines and like he does it and he loves it and he still enjoys for the most part coming to the escape room so it it, it is different it sounds like a wonderful childhood to me 
We'll see. I'll ask him in a couple of years and we'll see. Like, Dad, I don't want to go to the escape room. That place sucks. <laughs> a fun memory I was from when he was very young, like barely speaking. This was every single time whenever a guest did a big moment, I'll say in Captain Spooby Bones, he was hands in the air, cheering every, no matter where he was in the building, mm-hmm. you could just hear him. He's off in the back, maybe in his playpen or whatever, like that moment happens in Spooby Bones. You hear him way off back there cheering and yelling because he, yeah. yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Thank you for bringing that up. That's so awesome. adorable. I feel like that's prime TikTok material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, yeah. But yeah, it was fun. It was just it never stopped. It was a hundred percent of the time. Every time that moment happened, yeah, it didn't matter what he was doing. He could be eating. He could be in the middle of a sentence. He'd stop. He'd stop. Raise his hand in the air and cheer. I want your son to cheer me when I have great moments in escape rooms. I would enjoy that very much. (laughs) Yeah, that's funny. It's tough. The work-life balance, it's up until really this point, it's been, dad has got to go to work. If if I'm not at the space, I'm here working on something. And it's the same with Mike. We're working to an unhealthy degree. So there is that, there's the kind of the darker side of it as well, where it's you have to prioritize and how do we be in three places at once and who needs us the most right now and where are we maybe not doing so well i spend more time with my wife or spend more time with my kids or spend more time with the staff or spend more time with mike like we we all are just doing our best to make it happen so it's not easy we come up with funny stuff and that's doldricks and that's it no there's a lot of work this is the hardest thing that we've ever done for sure Thanks in no small part to the efforts of Doldricks, Orlando has become one of the hotspots for high-quality escape rooms in North America. In fact, Room Escape Artist just finished a sold-out tour there in November of 2023. Well worth a visit the next time you're in Central Florida. For the final episode of the season, PG and David welcomed back author and podcast host AJ Jacobs, along with Greg Pliska, his chief puzzle officer. Together, they release a popular daily short-form podcast called The Puzzler. In this clip, PG asks AJ and Greg to reveal a few of their tips for creating a fun and engaging podcast puzzle. I have designed a few games for the podcast. We had a Halloween special edition that was mostly puzzles and trivia, but it's really difficult to create games exclusively for audio. And we talked about a few things that make for a good audio puzzle, but do you guys have any other tips of what does make for a good audio game or puzzle? It's a great question. I think I generally think in the contrarian perspective, what makes for a bad audio puzzle and how to avoid it? Greg, this is how I operate also. Always from negative, David. I call my process design with contempt. (laughs) I find all of the things I hate about a medium, about a process, about whatever, and then I figure out how do I avoid them. Exactly. That is hilarious. That's where Recon was born, our convention. (laughs) I love it. Right. Everything left must be good because you've eliminated all the stuff that wasn't. Exactly. Well, that is so funny. I mean, the ones that are always hard, but we do them anyway, are any kind of anagram puzzles. Mm. which will often proceed by saying it might help if you have pencil and paper and write this down because some of the best way to make an anagram of a given set of letters is to write them in a circle on a piece of paper and break up the original word form so you can see them just as a mix of letters. We did one with Baratunde that was great, where it was his first name anagrammed into a bunch of phrases. He has the most anagrammable name in history. I was really (laughs) impressed with that. A whole sequence. I couldn't solve those at all listening, really? but I was really impressed at the construction of them. Anagramming is hard even when you can write it down on a pen and paper. And I have to write down anagrams vertically. If I write it horizontally, I can't read it as anything other than left to right. What a great solving tip. Oh, I love that. I find if I put the letters vertically, it helps me be able to move them around mentally and not get trapped in reading them left to right. Have you tried doing them in a circle? Because that's my favorite. Oh, no, but that's a good tip. Or just like a jumble. I thought of another thing that I like to do that I think makes for a good audio puzzle. And that is to have the guests say something goofy. And Greg is very good at this. He had one based on poker face, Lady Gaga's poker face. So all of the answers began with the sound po, 
and you had to answer them in the poker face, like you had whatever it was, po 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 Poland. You had to say that. And we just recorded one with Mike Reese that I'm very excited to play because we have a do puzzle. So all of the answers have the sound do. I'm terrible at it. Go. There it is. That's better. We did one with Lisa Lowe based on David Bowie's changes. Ch -ch -ch changes. Yeah, where she was just saying ch -ch -ch chain gang or whatever the whatever the. And answer. she actually has a great voice, so it actually it was like added value that you got to hear her sing, but also solve the puzzle. But that element that asks the guest to make funny sounds or say something in a funny way just feels like automatically good audio because it's a lively, fun thing to hear. David and PG will be appearing on an episode of The Puzzler in early 2024, so be sure to keep an ear out for that. And that was the end of a packed season of incredible creators. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and even tell a friend. Season 7 is shaping up to be another blockbuster, with the first episode coming in March 2024. The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Teresa Piazza with support by Lisa Spira. This episode was written and edited by me, Steve Ewing. Music by Ryan Elder. Logo by Janine Proct. All of this is brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. <laughs>